God, you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. We bless your name. We invite you to speak to our hearts today through your word and through your servant. May we be changed and more like you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Plymouth Alliance Church. I want to give a special shout out to those who are watching online this morning. I have some friends who are following us on Facebook. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Garrett Merzberger, and I am one of those kids who, when their parents had him at birth, they named me Garrett, and then as soon as I got home, they decided to change my name to Gary. (laughs) I can say this because my mom's here this morning, but... So a third of you in this church know me as Garrett, a third of you know me as Gary, and a third of you don't know what to call me because you hear Garrett and Gary and you think, I just won't call him anything. (laughs) Um, But I go by either, I just want you to know. And the problem I have now is I can't really change my name to one or the other because those who know me as Garrett say, you're not a Gary, and those who know me as Gary say, you're not a Garrett, and so I'm stuck with both names, so, so here we are. But anyways, a little background about myself. I've been attending this church for about six years with my wife and three kids, and we've enjoyed every minute of it. About a year ago, after many months of encouragement from Pastor Gary and Pastor Don, um, I was able to share my testimony here, and that was truly a blessing. And then this past January, I was nominated and elected as an elder here in the church and have really enjoyed serving in that capacity for the last eight months to getting to know the elders, Pastor Pete, and really praying for this church and this congregation. And for those of you who were here maybe three weeks ago, um, I had the honor and privilege of baptizing my son right here in this pavilion, which was just an incredible moment for a father to be able to baptize his son. And I want to tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my life for the last year. For those of you who know me, this has been a crazy year, Uh, probably the hardest year of my life. It's been a roller coaster, to say the least. I've had some incredible highs and some incredible lows, and I'm going to share just a couple of those with you this morning. You see, in the last 12 months, I've lost or left two different jobs. I was unemployed for two months. Um, I actually ended up leaving a career an industry that I had worked for for the last 21 years, and I thought I would work in that industry for another 20 plus years. Those are some of the low points, but God, in only the way he can, he brought some incredible high points as well. Just three weeks ago, my wife and I purchased a family business, um, a furniture business in Sheboygan Falls, And uh, we are now the third generation owners of this business, and we are so happy. We have a total of five employees. It's my wife, myself, and our three children, and so it truly is (laughs) a family business. Um, Another high point, though, actually happened in this very church here about a year ago. You see, Elder Steve Locke was giving an update on our pastoral search, and he said something that morning that really just hit my heart and hit me at my core. You see, he said that the elders were having a hard time finding applicants uh, to replace Pastor Gary, and he said it's due to the fact that there just aren't men going into ministry any longer. And God hit me that morning. He hit me like I've never been hit. In fact, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, he said, Garrett, I mean Gary, (laughs) he said, "Um, why not you? Why can't you go into ministry? And over the last year, my wife and I have really been praying and trying to follow God's lead. And what does that look like? What does that mean? We live out in the Elkhart Lake area, and God's really put that area on our heart. You see, that's an area, it's not Iraq, but it is an area that needs Jesus. And so we are exploring what does this look like. Um, We, this fall, are planning to go to a church plant boot camp through the CMA. And um, this January, Lord willing, I hope to enroll in an online program through the CMA that would allow me to get my licensure within two years. And so you can see how God has been working through this time. And during the past 12 months, I said I was unemployed, so God gave me some time to reflect. 
And during that time, I not only had a chance to reflect on the last 12 months and what had happened, but I also had a chance to reflect on really my previous 20 plus years of employment in my career. And God got to show me over the last year of why things happened to me along the way. Why did I maybe fail at this? Or why did he put this job in my lap? Or why did I move to Texas? Or why did the things happen this past year that happened? And I really got to see how God connected these dots for the last 20 plus years to prepare me for this moment right now to be preaching in front of all of you to own our own business and why that fits in is because I'll now be able to work essentially part time and use that other time to go back to school and hopefully get licensure. And it was so cool. It's like I, I, I compared it to like a dot to dot and when you're done you see this amazing picture when you're done and that's how I feel like God has been preparing me for the last 20 plus years for this very moment. And during that time, I found myself in the book of Genesis, and I came across the story of Joseph. I'm sure many of you know the story of Joseph. You've probably read it to your kids. It's a great bedtime story, an incredible story of a young man at the age of 17 who was his father's favorite son. Anybody have a favorite child out there? <laughs> don't, don't answer that. Um, but you can see how that could cause some problems. But what I loved, or what I really fell in love with about the story was that Joseph's story was 21 plus years in the making. And you want to talk about a roller coaster ride. He had some extreme highs and some extreme lows. And I'm in no way comparing my life to Joseph's, but I just really connected with his story. And what I loved about his story is he had an incredible faith, he had an incredible hope, and he had an incredible love for his God throughout his entire journey. And that's really what I want to focus on on today, but before we get into the story of Joseph, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you in this outdoor pavilion on such a beautiful day. I thank you for those in this congregation here today and those who are watching online. Lord, I'd ask that you be with everyone here. Open their eyes, open their ears, open their heart to hear you. Father, may everyone from the youngest to the oldest here today leave with just one incredible takeaway that they can apply to their life this week. And Father, be with me as I'm preaching for the first time and there's many nerves that come with that. And just calm those and just speak through me in your name. Amen. Now the story of Joseph, I want to give you a little bit of background before I read a, a verse or two from, Joseph, or from Genesis. It's found in Genesis, as I just said. It's 13 chapters long from Genesis 37 to 50. Now, there are some incredible stories in the book of Genesis. If you think about it, there's obviously the creation story. There's the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, just some incredible figures. And yet jo God spends 13 chapters on Joseph. So I think he wanted us to pay attention to this story. A little background if you don't know the story. Joseph, his father's name was Jacob, and he had 12 sons who ultimately end up representing the 12 tribes of Israel. This story, I mean, you could preach, I could probably preach 12, a 12-week 12 series on the story of Joseph, and because this is my first time preaching and I don't know any better, I'm going to try to cram all 13 chapters <laughs> into one sermon. So strap on your seatbelt, because it's going to be a quick ride. But first and foremost, the story of Joseph is a history lesson. It's how the Israelites found themselves in Egypt in the first place. You see, there was a famine in the land, and Jacob sent his sons to go find food so that they wouldn't die. And so that is literally how the Israelites found themselves in Egypt in the first place. The story of Joseph is probably the second greatest story of character in all the Bible, followed only by Jesus. The story of Joseph is a story about how God's timing, his timing is always perfect. You see, Joseph's story was 20 plus years in the making, as I said, from the time he was sold as a slave at age 17 to the time he saved and rescued his family, 21 plus years had passed. The story of Joseph is an amazing story of divine providence, of how God's intervention of what man intends for evil, God can use for good. And that's going to be our scripture verse that we're going to read here in a minute. You see, there are so many stories found in these 13 chapters with how to deal with things like how to deal with temptation, how to deal with hatred, a painful past, a dysfunctional family. The list could go on and on. And yet today, today I want to focus on how Joseph's life is a beautiful parallel to the life of Jesus and how this book and all the books of the Bible really point us in one direction, to the love of Jesus Christ. 
Now, for our scripture reading, I would love to read all 13 chapters of Genesis about Joseph, but I think that might take a little long. So I've decided to focus on Genesis chapter 50. If you would turn there with me now. It's the last chapter of Genesis, and Genesis is the first book in the Bible. You can take out your devices or your Bible. Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 to 21. A little background before I read this. This is the very end. This is the last chapter of Genesis. Joseph is talking to his brothers here, his 11 brothers. His father, Jacob, had recently passed. Joseph's brothers, if you recall, when he was 17, sold him into slavery, and now his brothers are deathly afraid that he's going to seek his revenge. And this is Joseph talking to his brothers. He says in Genesis 50, verses 19 to 21, But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Now, you see in your outline I have three main, main points, and I mentioned in my intro that Joseph was a man of incredible faith, incredible hope, and incredible love. I want to ask you today, have you ever gone through hard times? I'm sure everyone in here has. Do you ever feel like the deck was stacked against you or been treated unfairly or been wrongfully accused of something you didn't do? Well, Joseph, you see, he had it rough. If you want to turn to Genesis 37, as I said, I'm going to go through all 13 of these chapters pretty quick. Um, I'm going to just, you can page along with me if you want to, but in Genesis 37, we see in verses 4, 5, and 8, something gets called out very quickly in Joseph's story. In fact, three different times it uses the word hate, that his brothers hated him. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine living in a family with 11 brothers and all 11 of them hate me. That had to be a rough start, especially at the age of 17. And as the story continues, his father sends Joseph out to go find his brothers. And as he, as he sees them and they see him coming off from the distance, they plot to kill him. But rather than kill him, they see some slave traders coming by and they decide to sell him. Let's make some money off of him. And so in Genesis chapter 37, verse 28, we see that he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. He then, fast forward a little bit, he gets brought into Egypt. He gets bought by Potiphar. Potiphar is essentially the commanding army at that time, or the commander of the army at that time. And he gets placed in charge of all of Potiphar's household. And yet while he's there, Potiphar's wife takes notice of him. And this is that story of temptation that you could go into. And rather than fall into that trap, Joseph refuses. And ultimately Potiphar's wife accuses him of raping her. So he gets unfairly accused in Genesis 39, verses 14 to 18. And then ultimately, he gets thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit. So he gets unfairly punished. We read that in Genesis 39, 19 to 20. So let me quickly recap. Here's a young man at the age of 17. He was hated by his brothers. He was sold for silver. He was wrongfully accused. And he was unfairly punished. Does that sound like anybody else to you in the Bible that you can think of? You see, the incredible parallelism that Joseph's life is to Jesus is just remarkable. And, and there's, I'm going to call out a few different parallelisms throughout the sermon, but there are so many. I bet you could find 50-plus things that parallel his life to Jesus' life. You see, in John chapter 7, verses 4 to 7, Jesus himself is speaking to the disciples, and he says to them, The world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And later on in John 15, he says to them, they hated me and my father. You see, Jesus was hated by his brothers. You remember Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver? Well, before Jesus' crucifixion, we know that one of his disciples betrayed him, and what did he do? He sold him, or sold him out, for 30 pieces of silver. Again, a direct parallel tie there. We also know that he was falsely accused at Jesus's, um, before he got crucified at his, at his trial, we read that Pilate's wife says in Matthew chapter 27 that Jesus is innocent. And essentially Pilate washes his hands of the trial and turns him over to the crowd and Jesus ultimately gets unfairly punished. Now, I, I know and I, and I have to believe that these two men throughout that time in the Bible doesn't say anything about how they lost faith. They had incredible faith. And you're probably asking yourself, how could Joseph at the young age of 17, after everything that had happened, sold by his brothers, 
wrongfully accused, thrown into prison. And I want to remind you, this wasn't just any prison. In fact, in Psalms, it says that he had his legs chained and chains were put around his neck. This was no minimum security prison that Joseph was in. And how, how in the world could this young man have faith? If you go back and look at chapter 39 and you read it slowly, there's something that gets repeated four different times in that chapter. And this is something that I, I want to pause for a commercial, that if you're having your daily devotions and you read through a chapter really quick, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I would encourage you to slow down. Read, maybe you spend a week on a chapter and reread it, and you're going to be amazed at what jumps off the page at you. And to me, what jumped off the page to me was that God repeated in chapter 39 that the Lord was with Joseph. In verse 2, it says the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. In verse 3, it says when his master saw that the Lord was with him. In verse 20 and 21, it says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. And in verse 23, it says the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph. Now, I think God calls us out for two reasons. First and foremost, when and where does it say that the Lord was with him? It's not when he was at home and he was his favorite child and he had this amazing coat, although I'm sure the Lord was with him there. In fact, we know that because the Lord revealed himself in his dreams to him there. But it says that he was with him when he was at the lowest point possible. He was at a point where every fear was exposed, where he was in prison. He had been sold by his brothers. He was at an absolute low point, and that's where we see that the Lord was with him. You see, sometimes God is in the least place that you would expect it. And that was definitely the case with me over the last 12 months as I went through this roller coaster. But I think there's another reason why he calls this out four different times in chapter 39. Because you've got to remember, this is the first book in the Bible. This is Genesis. And back then, gods were territorial, right? You had the God of Israel, the God of the Philistines, that sort of thing, right? Gods were in their area. And yet, where is Joseph at this time? Joseph isn't in Israel. He's in Egypt. And yet it says the Lord was with him. You see, our God is not a territorial God. And this is the first point in the Bible that it really calls this out, that the Lord was with him in Egypt. You see, no matter where you're at, no matter what your struggle, no matter what you're going through at this time, remember, like Joseph, to have faith that God is with you no matter where you're at. That brings me to my second point, that Joseph had an incredible hope, and I would encourage you all to remember to have hope, again, no matter what you're going through. You ever expect to hear good news, and then you don't receive any news at all? That's the worst, I think. I, sometimes you expect to hear good news, and then you get bad news, but I think it's worse when you expect to hear good news, and then you don't hear any news at all. Well, Joseph experienced this, but he didn't lose hope. If we pick up the story where I left off, Joseph was now in prison. And we get introduced to two new characters in, while he's in prison. The chief cupbearer and the baker get thrown into prison. Now they work directly under Pharaoh, under the king. And they now find themselves in prison with Joseph. And while they're there, Joseph notices that they look downcast. I just think that's cool that he's in prison and he's yet... Instead of having a pity party for himself, he notices that someone else was looking down. And he asks them, why are you looking so sad? And they say they've had these dreams and no one can interpret them. And Joseph doesn't say, I can interpret them. He says, I can't, but God can interpret those dreams. And so he interprets the cupbearer's dream and the baker's dream. And essentially, he says to the cupbearer, in three days, you will be restored to your position working for the king. And to the baker, he says, in three days, you will be at that same party, but you will be executed After he told the cupbearer his interpretation of the dream, he asked the cupbearer to remember me. When you get out and when you talk to Pharaoh, remember me. Remember that I've been here unfairly. Remember to tell Pharaoh that. So three days passes and these two guys get out. And just as Joseph had said, the cupbearer gets restored. The baker gets executed. And wouldn't you know it, the cupbearer forgets to tell the king about Joseph. Now I don't know about you, but... Two hours would have passed, I would have been waiting. Two days would have passed, and I still would have been kind of excited, waiting to get out. Two weeks, two months, a year. We see in Genesis 41, verse 1, it starts with, when two full years had passed. Now I don't know about you, but I would have lost all hope in those two years that I was never going to get out. I would have been so angry at the cupbearer 
I'm probably angry at God for allowing all this to happen to me, a young boy doing everything right, and now I'm in prison, and I had a chance to help this guy, and he forgot all about me. Well, fast forward a little bit. Pharaoh now has some dreams, and no one in the land can interpret them. And finally, after two years, the cupbearer remembers. I know a guy. He interpreted my dreams when I was in prison, and he tells Pharaoh about Joseph, and Joseph summons or Pharaoh summons Joseph to come and interpret his dream. And what does Joseph do when the king asks him, can you interpret my dream? He doesn't say, well, sure, but first you've got to get me out of prison. He didn't negotiate. He didn't say, oh, I want my revenge on Potiphar or Potiphar's wife or, you know, that cupbearer, I want him thrown in prison for getting me, for forgetting me for two years. He doesn't do any of that. In fact, he doesn't even say he can interpret the dream. The first words out of his mouth were, I can't. I cannot do it but God can. Now here's a guy, I can't imagine, everything possible that could go wrong has gone wrong, and he has one chance to take credit for something, one chance to get his freedom back, and he doesn't do that. Instead, he gives all the credit, all the glory, and all the praise to God because, you see, he had an incredible hope in Christ, and that's where he placed his trust and hope. The last point, so he had incredible faith, he had incredible hope, and we see that he had incredible love. If you fast forward in his story, and as I said to you at the beginning, I'm going through 13 chapters rather quickly, but if you fast forward in his story, there's now, uh, he's been, he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and if you recall, there was going to be seven abundant years and seven years of famine. We're through the seven abundant years, we're now in the seven years of famine, and his father and his sons are starting to starve back in Israel. And so his father sends his son to go into Egypt to buy food. This is that history lesson, as I was talking about, of how they ended up in Egypt. And as Joseph finally gets reintroduced to his brothers after 20-plus years, after everything that had gone on, if you think about what had gone on with him and his brothers, his brothers hated him, and they sold him. First, they were going to kill him, and then they sold him. He was wrongfully imprisoned, sat there for two years. When he finally reveals himself to his brothers, he doesn't seek revenge. In fact, he tells his brothers who he is. He cries tears of joy. He sends his brothers back home to tell his family that Jesus, or Jesus, that Joseph, tell them Joseph is alive He goes back, his brothers go back and tell his family that he's alive. His family and his father come into Egypt and ultimately Joseph redeems his family, though they did not deserve that. We see that in Genesis 42. And lastly, we see that Joseph, he ultimately presents his family to Pharaoh. He goes in front of Pharaoh, presents his family. You've got to remember his family were shepherds. They were the lowest of the low, and yet he went in to Pharaoh, the king, he presents his family to them, and Pharaoh gives them land, he gives them provisions, and he rescues them. This parallel to Jesus, this is probably my favorite parallel. If you look, his brothers go and tell his father that Joseph is alive, and my friends, as we sang earlier, and as we heard, Jesus is still alive today. And just like Joseph redeemed his family, though they did not deserve it, we know that Jesus, he paid our debt even though we did not deserve it. We read that in John 3.16, right? One of the most famous verses in all the Bible. For God so loved the world. He loved us that he sent his son for us. And just like Joseph presented his family to Pharaoh, someday Jesus will present us to God. And my prayer is that he will say to each and every one of us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, he did this out of love. As I said, he didn't do it out of hate or revenge, or he could have done so much, but instead he revealed himself out of love. And that showed his brothers three things. It showed them that he was be able to bring them peace. He wasn't going to kill them. And they were deathly afraid that he was going to kill them. So it brought them peace. It also assured his brothers of protection. You see, he had now brought them into Egypt, and he was second in command, no one was going to dare touch his family because Joseph was so high up. And lastly, it guaranteed them plenty 
of everything. Pharaoh gave them food, it gave them livestock, gave them land. And how true of this, of all this, is that Jesus, that same story, that he can bring us peace, that he can bring us protection, that he will provide for us. And he does this for all of us. Why? Because he loves us. And I love the quote, and I used it in my testimony as well, that Pastor Gary used to repeat over and over and over again, that we are more loved by Jesus than we will ever, ever comprehend. Don't ever forget that. So what? What does this mean to you? I'd like to just ask you the simple question of that. How does this apply to you? So what? When you look back on Joseph's journey, do you see any similarities to your life? Are you wrestling with God to do things your way? Do you get angry with God when things don't go according to your plan? I can tell you that for much of my life, I thought I was doing great. I was living by my plan, and I had Jesus in the passenger seat. And I can even remember kind of looking over and talking to him and being like, isn't this great? We are doing so wonderful together. And yet I was, I was the one driving. It wasn't Jesus. And it took a major hit upside the head this past year for me to realize that. And even though this past year was probably one of the hardest years of my life, I've had the most peace that I've ever had. And I really think it's one of the greatest years of my life. You see, I've experienced a peace that passes all understanding. Christ has protected me along the way, and he has provided for me just as Joseph did for his family and Jesus has done for each and every one of us here today. I want to close with a quote. As I was preparing for this sermon, I actually found a book that was written by W.H. Griffith Thomas. This book was written in the 1800s, and I'm not much of a reader, so reading a book from the 1800s, you can imagine, would have been difficult, but I just fell in love with this book. And he has a quote, and it's a long quote, but I want to really point out two parts in this quote, or hopefully they strike you like they struck me. And the quote goes like this. It says, let us cultivate the habit of investing every detail of life with significance and try to learn the precise lessons that God desires to teach us. You catch that? To learn the precise lessons that God desires to teach us. Let us refuse to limit God and his providence to the great occasions of life and let us believe that nothing Nothing can come across our pathway unless it is in some way or other part of his loving, wise will concerning us. Let me read that last line again. Let us believe that nothing can come across our pathway unless it is in some way or other part of his loving and wise will concerning us. Let me tell you, friends, I had some lows as 